Kong Bon Wa, fellow queens and kings. Welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T U R N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. The legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal, Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Today on Ralph Reads, I open the pages of Book 2 for Volume 2 of the Supreme Sister Soldier's bestseller, Midnight and the Meaning of Love. I can only wonder how it has to be, irrationally traveling internationally. Actually, anybody will lose their common sense. Let the reading commence. Chapter 3 The orange sun saw me first, so bright it burned through the paper-thin curtains and cast colors onto the cream-colored walls. Warm like a sauna, it woke me at 5 a.m., boasting that it had cheated me out of my fajar prayer, which normally had my head pressed to the ground before dawn especially on this first full day of the Ramadan fast. I took it as both a sign and a reminder that to win on this side of the world, I had to move faster, rise up earlier like their son, think quicker, and adjust. I slid my door room open with ease. I glanced down the hall. There was no one out there. I grabbed my towel, washcloth, t-shirt, boxers, and a bathroom bag, a black leather case filled with everything I needed. I walked down to the only men's room servicing the first floor. Inside, there were five showers and five urinals and three toilets. Instead of the urinals being on the wall and positioned at waist height, their urinals were on the floor. Seemed like the Japanese felt closer to the floor, so they designed the urinals for shorter, smaller men. I took aim. After showering and dressing, I returned to my room and spread out my second towel onto the floor to serve as a prayer cloth. In the Asian heat, I made my prayer. At 6.15 a.m. in Tokyo, I continued my studies. I cracked open my book on Japanese culture. Even by selecting just a few passages or pages, I believe I might stumble on something useful. The author of Peculiar People, The Japanese Way, even before beginning his book, provided a list. Ten things I am sure you don't know about the Japanese, quote unquote. I liked non-fiction writers who could get to the point in a reasonable amount of time, so I decided to concentrate on the list. Number one. The Japanese believe that they are superior to all other people in the world. For 2,000 years, they did not even allow any foreigners to enter Japan, and they made it illegal for Japanese citizens to leave Japan and go anywhere else in the world. It doesn't matter who you are, European or African. It does not matter if you're also Asian as well, Korean, Chinese, Thai, Vietnamese, or even Indian. The only thing that matters to them is whether or not you're Japanese. Every non-Japanese is believed to be less or below them and is described as, quote, foreign, unquote, or gaijin, which in Japanese means outside people. Number two, the Japanese have the most complicated writing 
and language system in the world. They use three different forms of writing, hiragana, katakana, and kanji. Years ago, there were up to 10,000 kanji that students and citizens of Japan had to learn and perfect. Today, the average Japanese student must master hiragana, katakana, and 3,000 additional kanji letters. Students beginning from a young age spend 10 to 12 hours a day in school and after school and night school programs in their highly exhausting and competitive educational system. The Japanese use the fact that most foreigners consider their language impossible to master as evidence that the Japanese are superior. Number 3. The Japanese are very hard on one another. They do not believe in being or doing minimum or less than the most. They believe every Japanese citizen should strive to be excellent and work for the first place position every day and all the time. Every Japanese should be Ichiban, meaning number one. Number four. The Japanese are obsessed with all Japanese people being the same and doing the same things. They believe that this is how harmony is maintained in a society. Therefore, when you enter a Japanese business or school or government office, all the employees and students are normally dressed exactly the same way. The workers and students look down on anyone who dares to break the quote-unquote harmony or the quote sameness unquote. A person who dares to be different can suffer a lifetime of ridicule and isolation and loss. This practice is known as kata, or the Japanese way, and the Japanese have learned a precise uniform way of doing each and every task, including living life. Number 5. The Japanese do not know how to express themselves honestly. They repress their feelings intentionally because historically, the punishment they received for self-expression or for doing anything that was not approved or prescribed by the authorities was severe and often cost them and their family members their lives. Even though today the Japanese no longer live under an emperor or any type of oppressive government or authority, they still believe in speaking less, expressing less, appearing satisfied even when they are depressed and unhappy. They are suspicious of all foreigners and anyone who does the opposite, such as talk too much, grab too much attention, or burden other people with their problems. Number 6 the Japanese of today can only tolerate foreigners as long as you are a tourist on a short stay. They will be pleasant and polite and accommodating to this group because they will also earn money from this group through tourism and other business ventures. However, if foreigners try to remain in Japan beyond a short stay, they will experience a great and solid social and cultural isolation and they will eventually feel the full power of the Japanese law. Japanese immigration policy is one of the most unwelcoming, exclusionary immigration policies in the world. Number 7. It is the responsibility of every Japanese to, quote, save face, unquote. This means that the Japanese must work overtime to look good and be good and be successful in every way down to the most minor details. They must be successful in conversation, business, education, family, and friendship. To be embarrassed is to be shamed. To be shamed is to quote-unquote lose face. To be embarrassed would be not to fit the Japanese formula, the Japanese way in all things. Each Japanese person will apply the formula to every other and pass judgment severely on anyone bringing embarrassment or shame onto their name 
their family, their friends, or their business. If you are a foreigner and you are speaking to a Japanese, for example in English, even if the Japanese person does not speak English, he will not admit that he does not understand you. To admit this would be to say that he does not know something. Even a simple matter like this will cause him to lose face. Therefore, a Japanese may choose not to speak to a foreigner at all and ignore him instead rather than experience embarrassment. They are more comfortable knowing that you cannot speak Japanese and that this is the real problem. Saving face is so important to the Japanese that a Japanese person would consider committing suicide as a reasonable option to cover up, prevent, or atone for a loss of status and loss of approval from his co-workers, peers, and neighbors. The Japanese historically have even had a procedure for how suicide should be carried out properly so as not to disturb or burden anyone else further with their miserable life or even their death. Number 8. If a foreigner is successful in doing business with the Japanese, no matter how long the business alliance lasts, the Japanese will never accept that foreigner as, quote, one of us, unquote. You may take part in all business functions and business affairs, but you will never be welcomed to marry into their families, to attend their weddings memorial services, or rituals. For a Japanese person to invite quote-unquote outsiders to such events will be considered a disruption of the quote-unquote harmony and the Japanese way. Today, the Japanese are so suspicious of foreigners that they have even become suspicious of full-blooded Japanese citizens who have traveled to other countries and resided there for long periods of time. They look at them as Japanese who have compromised their Japanese-ness. Japanese persons who marry outsiders or foreigners run a high risk of losing their family, friends, and respect. They become victims of Izume, a collective and powerful disapproval that leads to a solid ignoring of this person's existence. Number 9. Despite being a small island, Japan has dominated, invaded, usurped, and degraded all its larger neighbors, including the overpopulated and massive mother of Asia, China. The Japanese had never lost a war until World War II, when they were conquered by the Americans. Even after being conquered, bombed, and occupied, the Japanese worked so hard and so harmoniously with such precision and perfection that they rebuilt their country and brought their economy back to life and dominance in a short period of time. They are the third largest economy in the world today, and Tokyo is the third most expensive city for people to live in in the entire world. Number 10. The Japanese do not believe in God. Their roots are in Confucianism, Buddhism, and Shintoism. There is no Japanese religion despite the effort of many groups and organizations, including Christian missionaries, to influence their nation. The Japanese believe in themselves, their relatives, and ancestors. They believe in quote-unquote harmony, perfect manners at all costs, and even during a crisis. They believe in discipline and controlled organization, peace and law and order. They believe in money and hard work, but even when presented with the opportunity for great profit, they will not sacrifice or exchange the quote-unquote Japanese way of life. 
They believe that the Japanese method or process is the smartest and only method. If they lose business with outsiders who are unwilling to do it their way, they believe that they are smart enough to earn the business that was lost by some other means while maintaining their superiority and exclusivity. The list was mind-blowing to me. At first, it made me suspicious about the author and the author's intentions. Next, I felt forced to reread the list and separate each numbered item and pause and think about it and compare it to my few experiences with Akemi's Japanese family in America. Then I had to circle the words that I didn't understand on that list to look them up. On my second read, I picked out the things on the list that were similar to what I know about my own people, the Sudanese. There were a few cultural similarities, but there were definitely more differences. I had never thought of Akemi as an atheist. For a Muslim man to marry an atheist is Harun, forbidden. She never felt like a non-believer to me. A woman with no God or faith or belief would feel cold and empty, I guessed. She would have no standards or boundaries, I figured. On further thought, it was impossible for me to look at my wife in relation to this list. It was also not possible for me to lump her in some big category like the Japanese. I can only look at my wife based on what I learned of her by watching and observing and interacting and feeling. I didn't know if this list was all true, but I knew that the list felt cold and empty. My wife felt warm and full of life and love and pure sweetness and talent, like my Uma. In my Anakemi's marriage contract, I had gifted her a beautiful blue bound and hardcover Holy Quran translated from Arabic to her Japanese language. I had it here in my duffel. I never got the chance to present it to her properly, which I'd intended to do right after her big art show at MoMA. I looked forward to her reading it slowly and learning it side by side with me as a help to her. I wanted her to embrace it because her soul had embraced Islam knowingly and not just because I told her to. Another thought occurred to me. The list did match my idea of Naoko Nakamura, my wife's father. At least it matched the profile that was slowly forming in my mind. I became certain that this was the reason Sensei gave these two books to me. As I reflected, Sensei had said that my wife was under tremendous pressure here in Japan. The list certainly helped me to understand why and what kind of isolation she might still be facing. It also created a deep curiosity in me. If these listed items had any truth, why would a girl like Akemi, raised in this way, leap over the carefully drawn, bold boundaries of her culture and into my arms, heart, and life? At 8.25 a.m., I was lying on my back on my bed with the book opened and pressed on my face, thinking. When I pulled the book off, I checked the time and jumped up to make the morning call to Iowa Akita, like I had promised to do. The hostel payphone was on the first floor, like me, but on the opposite side of the building in the corner. I walked down and over and made the call, hoping. I was phone rang three times before her voicemail kicked in. Immediately, I hung up. I took a deep breath. I sat there for a moment. Six minutes later, I picked up the phone once more, prepared to leave another message. After all, this was the only telephone number for my wife that I had. Akita-san, 
Oh, how you go see mas? Boku wa mayonaka deska. I am calling to speak to Akemi. I was hoping to arrange a conversation with her. She left your number as a friend and the person to contact. Thank you for your help. I'll call back later today. If I don't reach you, I'll keep trying. Hopefully, we won't be disconnected at that time. After I hung up, I just sat there. I was debating in my mind whether I should have left Iwa Akita my telephone number here at Shinjuku Uchi. I already knew that even if I were not in at the time, that she might return my call. The front desk receptionist would take messages for me and place them in the tiny mailboxes up front reserved for paying guests. But maybe calling back to leave a number would backfire on me. I had already begun to distrust Iowa's motives. I got up and walked back down the hall and over toward my room, regulating my anger. Anger was not the correct posture for Muslims fasting during the Ramadan holy holiday. When I slid my room door open, Chiesa was sitting on my bed with her shoes off and feet propped up. Her unpolished, clean, clear toes were unblemished. She pressed them into my sheet. Situated below her feet on the floor were Akemi's high heels. I saw that she had removed them from my desk where I kept them last night. Nice shoes, she said, half smiling, noticing my eyes, frozen, on the floor. What are you doing in my room? I asked her before getting tight. You called me, she said casually, without even a grin. No, I said, treating her statement as a question, even though it wasn't. You did, she smiled and sat up straight. Now her feet were dangling above Akemi's shoes. I could see Akemi's diary lying beside her on my bed. She had also removed that from my desk. Hand me that, I told her, referring to Akemi's diary. She handed it over. I received a telepathic communication from you, she said, with a straight, no-nonsense look. I didn't respond, just looked at her hard. My face must have triggered something. Suddenly, she seemed insulted by it. Honestly, if you say that you didn't say my name once in your mind since you said goodbye to me at the airport, if you didn't think about me at all or see me in your dreams, I'll leave you right now, and you'll never see me again. Her soft voice had no humor mixed in it. She spoke sweetly, but with confidence. She was challenging me now, and revealing that she had a slight mean streak running through her. Did you? She followed up, her gray eyes searching mine. Did you think about Chiesa? Her long lashes affected me. I did, but I was going to let her know it was not how she seemed to be thinking about it, but she interrupted me. You see? You did. I knew it, she said, turning as though she was talking to someone standing beside her. Then she threw her hands up in a gesture that normally meant touchdown and fell backward back onto my bed. I received your message right here, she said, with one index finger pointed at her head. So I came. Chiesa, I said, I'm only out here for a few days, and I have a lot to take care of before I leave. I don't have the extra time to play games. This is business. Let me cut your time in half. Let me help you, she pleaded with one hand on her hip. I speak the language. You don't. I know the train system. You don't. I can't connect you with anything that you need in Tokyo. And if you turn down my business offer, I'll go tell my boss that I am back home from the States and start delivering pizzas. Honestly speaking, 
I'd rather work for you. Japan is a no-tip country. Her tone softened. What? I asked. In Japan, no one expects a tip for anything they do. If you take a taxi, or if a bellman carries your luggage, or if you receive a food delivery, no matter how hard a worker works, or how good a job someone does, we don't require or accept one penny over the actual price. So whether I deliver two pizzas or 22 pizzas, it's all the same. If I work for you, there's no hourly rate. I name the price, you pay it. I'll do whatever it takes to get the job you want done, complete it. She was wearing a Lecoq Sportif peach-colored sweatsuit and orange converses with orange laces. Her sweat jacket was off and lying across my bed. The honey-colored skin of her shoulders and arms glistened. She was wearing a thin, tight tee, yet her full breasts were not exposed, nor was her belly button, but her curves were killer. She shifted from lying down to lying sideways. Her head was now resting in the palm of her left hand. She seemed eager for an answer. But at the same time, she was perched lightly like a bird that could take flight in a quarter of a second and disappear into the endless sky. No woman besides Uma or my wife had ever sat on my bed. Yet I had just met this girl yesterday and not even 24 hours ago. And she looked very comfortable. She was very helpful and unique and pretty. But I was here in Japan for only one reason, and that reason was definitely wasn't going to change. I took a deep breath and thought to myself, here I go again. If I could remove whatever type of magnet I had in my body that drew these women to me and kept them coming continuously, I would be faced with less of a challenge. I would be able to focus. I'm checking out of here, I told her. Why? She asked. This place has no lock on the bedroom doors. When I come and go, my luggage isn't secure. You walked right in here, so you know what I'm talking about. You don't need to leave here, she said casually. We Japanese don't steal. I let off a half a laugh. Nobody Japanese steals, I repeated, to let her hear how ridiculous she sounded to me. Seriously, I know. I grew up on an American military base. All kinds of stuff got stolen all the time. Eventually, they had to install cameras in certain areas. But outside of the base, on Japanese territory, no one Japanese steals. I could leave my bicycle, or motorcycle, or anything, no matter the value. No one Japanese will take it. I promise you. It's the Japanese way. I thought you said you grew up in Tokyo. I checked her. I did. My mom lives here in Tokyo. And she and my dad had a house on the Yokota Air Base about 45 minutes from here. Even though the American military bases are located here in Japan, inside the base is considered to be America. So I grew up both ways. That's why I can speak both languages fluently. No problem. So, are there a lot of Americans living here? I asked. Not really. The American military personnel and their families never leave the base except when traveling to the airport, coming and going. They have their own little world going on in there, plus everything that they think they need. But when we lived there, I left the base every day. Besides, my Japanese family lives in the real Japan. I reached into my pocket and pulled out a small stack of bills. I counted out 30,000 yen and handed it over to her. She took it easily, as though she had expected her pitch to work all along. Immediately, she handed me 1,000 back. She was giving me my change and at the same time proving both of her points. No stealing, no tips. She bowed down completely and eased up, singing, Arigato gozimasu. 
I understood that it was her culture to do so, but I said to her, don't do that anymore. She looked at me curiously. You can do it. Just don't do it to me, I corrected myself. Wakarimashita, she said, meaning she understood. But I knew she didn't. A woman bowing before me is erotic. When my wife does it, it gets me crazy. But I didn't want each female I met out here doing it to me. I needed help keeping everything in perspective. Get me a Tokyo phone book from the front desk. They should have one, right? Business or personal? She asked swiftly. Personal, I responded after a pause. She was up and out. Not even three minutes passed before she showed up with a massive book in her hand. 27 million people in Tokyo. Who do you want to look up? She was ready. Iwa Aikida, I told her. She sat on my bed and opened it up. She moved her fingers across the pages, swiftly scanning the extra small size kanji. I counted about four pages of people last name Aikida. That's about 400 families. But there's no Iwa. Maybe she's listed under her husband or father's name. That would be normal. Do you know it? She lifted her eyes from the pages to peer at me curiously. Nah, but I have her phone number, I answered. What? I'm looking for her address. I already have her phone number, I explained. Chiesa stood, staring, she said. So why not call her and ask her where she lives? I pulled Iowa's phone number from a back pocket and handed it over. Chiesa sat back down and tried to match the phone number to one of the numbers listed in the book. If it matched, she would discover the address printed beside it. I liked that she had a quick mind. Her number is not listed. Her family probably has money, she said nonchalantly. Those are the types that would pay extra to keep their information out of the phone book. It's not usual, though. Do you want to kidnap her? She asked, too casually. That costs extra. She smiled slightly. Nah, I don't kidnap. If a woman doesn't belong to me, I don't touch her, I assured. What next? Ginza. I gotta get to Ginza to check something out. You know Ginza is high-end, right? Whatever you're buying from there, I could take you somewhere else to get it, or something close to it, for much, much, much less. Nah, I'm not going shopping. I pulled the address out of my pocket and handed it to her. She held it with both hands and studied it like it was a riddle. She handed the paper back to me and said casually, That's easy. I gotta move out of here first. I got to move my luggage to a place where I could lock it up, I told her as I began repacking the few items that I had left out of my duffel. I see you don't trust anyone, she said. My Aunt Tasha says that a person who cannot trust anyone always ends up trusting the wrong people. I thought about her statement. It seemed like a tricky phase that someone who wanted to be trusted made up for their own advantage. I moved it out of my mind and finished packing. Do you have a camera? Chiesa asked out the blue. Why? Because what type of tourist wouldn't have a camera? She asked. I don't need it for now. Bring it. It's better to have something useful than to not have it. She smiled. I pulled the movie camera out of my bag. I paused for a second, then looked up at Chiesa and thought, This female is a sharp one. She had probably searched my bag already when she was in my room, uninvited and alone. She asked me if I had a camera, but I was guessing that she already knew the answer and was on to the next stage of her plan, whatever that was. But I had too much on my mind to try and figure her out. In one hour, she had been more useful than anyone 
or anything else. As we left the room, I noticed Chiesa's jacket lying on my bed. You forgot your jacket, I told her, after forcing her to understand that she could not carry even one of my bags. She answered, I'm leaving my jacket here. Why? I'm not coming back here, I told her. I just want to show you something, she said. You'll see. We walked out, leaving her jacket behind. She returned the phone book to the front desk as we exited. Outside the hostel and into the warmth, I saw her put something small on top of the cement post beside the hostel door. I looked up into a white sky and crimson sun. I know. Our sun is really bright, right? She asked. I didn't answer her, though my eyes were squinted enough for her to already know what I thought. Here in Tokyo, the sun rises early, but it also sets real early. But I don't live my life by the sun. I'll move around in the daylight or in the moonlight, just the same. She took some steps out into the street and flagged down a taxi. Don't touch the door, she said suddenly, and the taxi door opened automatically. She leaned in and spoke Japanese to the driver. The trunk opened automatically. I put my luggage inside and shut it. I jumped in the back beside her. We were off. Enjoy the ride, she said to me while looking out the window in the opposite direction. This is the only time that we will take a taxi. It's too expensive. But since you had to have your luggage... Shinjuku in the early morning daylight was like a fascinating amusement park with its one million still and blinking and blaring lights turned off and its best rides shut down. Now it was just a place where hundreds of people were walking and riding through just as a means to get somewhere else. When the wheels of the cleanest, most well-kept taxi that I have ever rode in turned off the main road, Shinjuku easily seemed like a suburb or a village. I saw a Japanese mother of three riding a bicycle with a baby seat in the front and another two seats behind her holding two happy, silent babies chilling. I saw other Japanese women dressed in business skirt suits and moderate heeled shoes and stockings carrying pocketbooks, purses, or briefcases in their baskets, watching and weaving through traffic while holding a compact mirror and applying lipstick at the same time. We pulled up steep hills and coasted down the slopes of narrow streets and hugged curbs around corners. My eyes were like hungry beasts scanning it all, leery of missing one alley or alcove or outstanding piece of architecture. Everything was so completely new that I neglected using the map I had in my back pocket, not wanting to overlook the real thing while checking for printed data on the paper. I can't lie, it was a busy yet strangely peaceful place. The men in suits moved in packs, all seeming neither happy nor sad to be headed to work. Laboring men wore stylish jumpsuits, all baggy, nothing tight, and quality work boots. Teens traveled in troops, all moving slow in identical uniforms, boys separate from the girls. Motorcycle riders eased by with little effort in the continuous flow of light traffic. People pimping pamphlets and coupons were setting up their distribution and promotion schemes, offering every walker an invitation to spend money at some place of business. Thin girls glided up hills without huffing or puffing. They remained seated and unstressed, pedaling in an unbroken rhythm on their bikes the same as if they were flat on land. Old people were energetic and agile, not swollen like sausages, or withered like raisins, or defeated with diabetes, or crippled by arthritis. Their clothes fit and matched, were clean and pressed. Any newcomer could tell that someone, somewhere, loved the seniors enough to help them maintain. I looked away once to check on Chiesa. 
She was facing front and sitting quietly. I liked that she was comfortable with silence. I liked that she was smart enough to let me become familiar with my surroundings, uninterrupted. We soon reached a wooded area that was blocked off by a long, heavy chain held up by two metal poles. Chiesa and the driver spoke some in their language. The driver swerved and entered what seemed to be a restricted area that led us into a paradise-like park with trees of every size and height and flowers of every color blossoming and spilling out to the service roads. Where are we? I questioned her. Home, Kaiser said calmly. I checked the meter and paid the driver, laying the bills in a rectangular dish that he tapped lightly. There was no bulletproof glass to protect him from me or from being choked or murdered by angry passengers. No little metal slot to drop the money in that you couldn't snatch back. No divider between the civilized and the suspicious and dangerous public customers like there is in Brooklyn, New York. Wearing his spotless white gloves, he picked up the dish and laid my change back in it with my receipt. Arigato gozimasu, he said to me in Chiesa boat. My door and the trunk opened simultaneously, automatically. Whose home is this? I asked. My grandfather's. I mentioned him to you. Actually, he's a retired park ranger. This is Yo-Yogi Park. Follow the stone path. I followed her. Why are we here? I asked her. You need some place secure to leave your luggage. That's what you said. That's why we're here. Hold up. You could just take me to a new hostel. I have a list of them in the area. But you already paid for two nights stay at Shinjuku Uchi. She answered. How would you know? I asked. A swift reaction. I talked to Jun-san when I arrived at your place this morning. He was working the front desk. I'm not slow, I told myself. But she is speeding. I knew I had to shake off whatever kind of fog my mind was in and watch her moves closely. Like my sensei would say, You have to make your mind light. If the mind is too heavy, you've lost your use of intuition and instinct, which every fighter needs. She led us up to a house and then walked past it. We were entering what I assumed was their yard. But actually, the whole park appeared to be their yard because hers was the only house in the area. I thought about her grandfather, the park ranger, quote-unquote. Where was he? Does a park ranger carry a gun? I asked myself. What about your grandfather? He's not home. How do you know? I followed up. Because his bike isn't out front. He's gone somewhere. How were you going to introduce me to him when you don't even know my name? I asked her, and she stopped walking, her back to me. She turned around with a calm and blank face. I know your name. I told you I was not asleep on the plane, but you told your name to Yuka first. I don't like her, and I refuse to use anything after she has already used it. I decided to call you something different. But I have only narrowed it down to three choices so far. I'm still deciding, she said, as though she could assign me a name. I had to smile naturally. You think you could give me a name? You think it's that easy? Since you gave Yuka your fake name and gave a different name to the Sinjuka hostel, I figured it was that easy. She stared back at me. I marked the date and location down in my mind. The first time I have ever been checked by a girl, quote-unquote. She turned back around and continued to walk toward two sheds, one made of metal, the other made of brick. She slid her hand into her left front pocket and pulled out some keys. She unlocked the heavy padlock on the brick shed and gently opened it up. You can put your luggage in here. This is my storage and the other is my grandfather's, she said. I paused. And since you don't trust anyone, I know that includes me. So after you put your things inside, I'll give you the keys until you take your stuff back out. 
She was dangling the keys between two pretty fingers with clear, unpolished nails. I stepped into a brick shed. She reached her arm past me and flipped on the switch. Now her shed had lights. I was inside as she stood outside, so confident in what she was doing that her back was to me. It was a fort of ammunitions. There was a large gun lying against the wall, but I wasn't familiar with the brand. Then my mind skipped ahead. She wanted me to see all this for a reason, I told myself. Chiesa, I called her. She turned and faced me. I pointed out the gun with no words or hands. Only my eyes. Just a tranquilizer gun. You know, in Japan, we have some wildlife. Seriously, we have bears. She said with a half smile. I got it from my grandfather. I borrowed it. She said casually. Yeah, I acknowledged. What about that? I saw you with that at the airport, I pointed. It's a Cayudo bowl. She turned toward me and stepped in and blocked the only entrance to the shed. Cayudo? I asked. You know, like a bows and arrows kind of thing. She positioned her arms and hands as though she were aiming and shooting one. However, the bow in her shed was the largest I ever seen. She stepped up and unzipped the case, revealing the dynamic weapon. As quickly as she showed it, she zipped it back up. I put my duffel bag up against the wall, right below some handcuffs that hung on a nail and across from some old nunchucks, also lodged on the wall. Besides several stacked storage boxes were a few pairs of mountain boots of different styles. On the nail were some rain ponchos. On the floor was about 30 feet of coiled, colorful climbing rope. In addition to a well-used, industrial-sized flashlight, there was a megaphone. When I saw some walkie-talkies, I stepped closer to them. We can use them, she said excitedly. The rest of the items Chiesa had in there were all inside cases. There were three long cases made of a thick blue cloth with wicked white kanji painted on it. There was only a flap and blue string tying down the tips of the cloth cases. My sword, Chiesa said. Old ones. I looked at my watch and saw that it was 10.15 a.m. Let's go, I told her, stepping forward so that she would step out. I pulled the door closed, noticing that it swung out and in like an American door instead of sliding sideways. I padlocked it and dropped the key into my pocket. My father built that for me. My grandfather's metal shed was always here, but when I came here to stay with him, my father built this one. She was speaking softly, more like she was talking to herself or moving with a memory. I remained silent deciding right then and there that she was the first gift of Ramadan on the first day of the fast. She was my sentinel, which Sensei said every ninja on a mission should have. When we reached the front of her house, she said, Chotomate! She bent down and removed her kicks and placed them together on the corner of the step. She entered her house, leaving me standing outside. I liked that she didn't ask me inside while her grandfather was not home but I didn't like her clothing change. Chiesa emerged wearing a dark blue miniskirt, a light blue blouse, and socks, and carrying penny loafers. Why the change? I asked. Everybody knows that a girl in a school uniform can get anything she wants in Japan, so you should just look at this as my costume. You'll see, she said without flirtation. As she kneeled to put on her shoes, I felt uneasy. She had a book bag the strap resting on one shoulder and pressing across her breast and down to her opposite hip where the bag rode. She had a second strap crisscrossing the same way. She pulled it off and over her head and handed it to me. She opened her book bag and pulled out a box. Welcome to Japan, she said, handing me the items. The army green canteen was filled with liquid. I opened the box. It was filled with perfectly sliced and neatly arranged fruits. You must be hungry. You didn't eat, she said, smiling. Thank you, Chiesa. I should have told you. 
While I'm here visiting Japan, I'll be fasting during the day from sunup to sunset, I confided. For the whole week? She asked incredulous. For the whole month, I said solemnly. Why? She asked. I'm a Muslim. This is a holy month for us, I said. She stood silent. Her gray eyes widened some and one of her eyebrows lifted. She paused, thinking. That's so f***ing cool, she said softly to herself. I like that. Then I won't eat or drink either. We'll both eat together at sunset. After switching train cars and going three stops, we arrived at Ginza. We walked a while through well-constructed, clean, and well-lit underground tunnels. The tunnels were so dope to me. It was clever to be moving underground beneath the city. They stretched a distance and were not hot, stinky, crowded holes in the earth like the subway system of New York where the rats raced. We reached a steep sequence of stairs leading us up and out into what had to be the heart of Ginza. From Shinjuku to Yoyogi to Ginza, there was a quality leap I swiftly noted. The other two prefectures were definitely not low quality, but Ginza was obviously high quality, like 5th Avenue in New York or 57th Street, but better, cleaner, and more attractive and elegant. I could see that the top designers of the world had their flagship stores located here. This place was about big business and buildings and billboards as multinational corporations squared off to see which one could post its name and logos up the highest with dominating whiffs. In between the corporate wars were unique Japanese boutiques and tailors and haberdashers and upscale restaurants and bakeries and art stores and timepiece workshops and retailers and acupuncture lofts and therapeutic massage spas and ice creameries and yogurt dens. I got drawn in by an astronomy shop with impassive telescopes and powerful lenses. I had never owned one, but the design of the shop and the display of the unusual equipment caught my eye. It was an awesome concept and invention, a lens that brought beautiful shining stars close to the eye of the human holding the piece of equipment. Every single car on the street seemed brand new. The few that weren't were so well cleaned and polished and free from dents and blemishes that they blended in. In Ginza, there wasn't only a handful of hustlers riding large like back in Brooklyn. The whole prefecture of Ginza was bubbling with limousines, Crown Victorias, Benzes, Rolls Royces, Maseratis, and Lamborghinis. The streets were wide and clean and free of potholes. The traffic was at a bare minimum and the flow of people was orderly but steady. Men wore suits, tweed jackets, linen, spring suede, and comfortable cottons. Some rocked ascots, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, and Yves Saint Laurent belts and briefcases, designer ties, or expensive traditional silks, robes, and slippers. Business shirts were crisp and ironed. The absence or presence of cufflinks and, of course, the quality of the silver, gold, and platinum ranked them one from the other. Not one shoe was run over or cheap, from the workers to the execs. Women were almost unanimously dressed in expensive, well-tailored clothes of every style from both the European and Asian continents. There were fine silks and lace and cotton and linens, and even their denim was threaded better, cut better, styled better, the material a deeper blue and more durable looking. As we walked further, my eyes cast down only to be introduced to a high-heeled heaven. Every feminine shoe seemed an expression of personality and poise and even preference. Each lady in front of me and moving past me was petite. Here in Tokyo, quote-unquote model slim was not relevant. In Ginza, Every female of every age was slim and sleek and following with a unique style of her own that made it difficult to determine the trend. It wasn't long before I realized that I had not seen any white people, Americans or Europeans. 
I'm not saying that there were none here, but I didn't see them. So many people, and each face clearly Japanese. Whether I glanced at the workers in the stores, the people in the streets, the executives moving about, the money earners, the money spenders, the owners, the buyers or sellers, the limo drivers or limo passengers, or even the window cleaners, they were all uniformly Japanese. This was Japan, and everything I saw confirmed that this was clearly their country. This whole area is Nakamura Plaza, Kieza said as she stopped walking and gestured. The building with the exact address that you are looking for is there, across the street, she pointed. And the guy whose name you had on the paper, Naoko Nakamura, he should be there on the top floor. She had her finger pointed toward the sky. Let's go, she said confidently. Hold up, I told her. As I stood stiff, she said, The paper you showed me said Naoko Nakamura, and this is Nakamura Plaza, and over there is the Nakamura building. Usually here in Japan, the most important people have their offices located on the top floor of an office building, or in a penthouse, or co-op, or condo. Isn't it the same in New York? She asked. I didn't answer was no longer focused on her or her voice. Looking up toward what I counted as the 33rd and top floor, and then beyond into the white cloudless sky, I inhaled and wished that I was fighting this fight using my father's mind instead of my own. I needed to be backed up by my father's empire and assets. I needed my father's ingenuity and access to the world. I exhaled, my mouth drying some from the start of the fast. What would be my next move? What would my father do in the scenario that I was facing? What would my father advise me to do now? I felt like the black king on the chessboard with no frontline defense, no pawns, and no sideline defense. No bishops, no rooks, no knights. Meanwhile... Naoko was chilling with the White King peace. Although his queen was dead, his wife, who was also Akemi's mother, his knights, bishops, and rooks, and a billion pawns in his multi-million dollar establishment were still securing him and assuring that he appeared monumental with an untouchable monopoly over my wife and his empire. What's the plan? Chiesa asked cautiously. I turned my head in the opposite direction from where she was standing, only to see a pack of teens and what I assumed was their chaperone gathering on the same side of the Nakamura building. An idea was forming. Do you know how to work the camera? I asked her. I will in 30 seconds, she answered. I handed it to her. She studied it. Okay. I got it, she said softly. Let's go make a movie. You be the director, I'll shoot whatever you want me to shoot. She smiled. Follow them in, I said, using my head nod to point her eyes in the direction of the schoolgirls. But we are wearing different school uniforms, she protested immediately. I didn't say join them. I said just follow them in. See if they are getting any kind of tour of the building. See if they give them any private information. If they do, you get it also. Use the camera to film the inside of the lobby and everything that is going on. But what are you looking for? She asked. I need a printout of the building directory, like the staff list. I need you to get in the parking deck. You can read the signs. Act like you're lost. Find the executive parking and film the cars and plates of all the executive vehicles. You're not going to do anything crazy, are you? Or legal? She asked defiantly. Before I could answer, she added, Because if you are, my fee has to be raised to the tenth power. She smiled, but I knew she wasn't joking. She seemed to want to let me know, in some subtle way, that she was down for whatever, as long as she was dealt with fairly and paid her asking price. She didn't have to worry. I would treat her right, naturally. Besides, I would not forget about her father. I didn't need two madmen trying to destroy me at the same time. Nothing crazy, nothing illegal. I'm just collecting information. I'm just looking for something, I told her solemnly. 
Are we looking for the girl whose little feet fit in those hundred thousand yen heels? She asked straight faced. I didn't answer. That gotta be it. She said coyly. Don't worry. I'll get it done. She left with the camera in hand and the power button on and the red record light all lit up. As I stood thinking in the midst of the moving crowds, I believed I heard my father's response to my frustrated call for guidance. The volume of the comings and goings of Ginza dropped down. I could only hear him. My father said to me, Naoko Nakamura is an Asian elephant known for his wisdom and intelligence. He's too large to confront or directly charge into. He is mammoth. He's someone you've got to go around. Stay out of his area or you'll get a stampede. Lay low in the tall grass. Give him the day. You take the night. And his voice left as swiftly as it arrived. So it was decided. I would not enter Naoko Nakamura's building to demand to meet with him and ask, Where's my wife? or enter any diplomatic display of etiquette and approval as my Uma has suggested. My eyes followed the skyline. Having turned 360 degrees twice, I selected a suitable target building and began walking. At the astronomy boutique, I copped a powerful pair of waterproof, fogproof, shockproof Nikon binoculars for $250. When I got to my target, I eased on my sunglasses and entered like I belonged there. Confident, I strode in like a paying customer. Perched on the 32nd floor of a building adjacent to Naoko Nakamura's, I adjusted the button that put the powerful binoculars lenses into focus. Although the windows of the Nakamura building, the top executive floors, were covered by expensive wooden vertical blinds preventing me from seeing in, I could see, though, all the other windows. I looked into his place, brought so close into my view that it cast the illusion that I could just extend my arm to touch it. I learned very little. The Nakamura building was just that, a well-built tower of expensive offices and well-dressed employees. Sprinkled in between were high-end restaurants, tea rooms, and lounges. Every now and then, the lens would capture suited smokers gathering in a specific area or workers conferencing at the water cooler. I peeped also what seemed like a company gym stretched out over an entire floor with all kinds of equipment and in steady use. There was one place packed with pets and another floor with loads of little children and their chaperones or teachers. No one was using the staircases. I assumed their elevators were in full rotation, but I could not see those. The parking decks were on the lowest floor. I could view tops of cars, but cement walls shielded the car bodies. I saw some medical offices and thought to myself, Here's a man who seems to have thought of everything. A veteran of years of thought battles. My mind began to race as I tried to determine what exact advantages I might have. Akemi's father was my opposite, it seemed. He was high profile, like an elephant that stands 13 feet tall and weighs 80,000 pounds. I told myself, he can't avoid being seen. His every moment shakes the earth. He's so high profile, in fact that he must be discussed and written about in Tokyo and throughout Japan all the time. Whatever business or events where he would appear must be recorded, I figured. And further, if I could locate him at a specific place in time at a public event, perhaps my wife would be there also. I had to maneuver to use his high visibility against him, I concluded. I left the hotel where I was posted as soon as I caught Chiesa in my lens outside the Nakamura building shooting footage of a gang of school kids, most of them holding two fingers up to form a peace sign. She looked happy and excited, magnified in my lens. She was real comfortable giving them directions about how and where to stand. She even convinced a girl to climb on top of a statue.
It's done, she assured me. But we'll have to go to my house to watch the footage. That's the only way you can play the tape, and I got these. She handed me a short stack of flyers, papers, and newsletters as well as a map. Put them in your bag and hold them for me. We gotta get to Rapongi Hills, I told her. Rapongi Hills? She repeated. Expensive taste, she murmured. I pulled out the second Tokyo address I had for Naoko and Akamura. I was hoping it didn't end up being a business complex like this one. I was still hoping to discover my wife there. As we moved through the streets of Ginza, Kieza pointing out things in English and then told me the Japanese words for those things, she began with the binoculars. Sunkyu, she said. Sky. Sora. Tree. Kai. Car. Kurumba. Bus. Basu. Man. Otoko. Woman. Yose. Student. Gakusei. Store. Mise. Book. Horn. Window. Maro. Building. Peter. Motorcycle. Baiku. Police. Keisatsu. When she said a word that I already learned from flipping through my study cards, I would call it out before she could translate it. The little word game was helping my language lessons to stick. When we both saw a kid drinking bottled water, Kieza smiled and we both say, Miser. Kieza crossed both her forearms into an X to show me that she remembered that there's no drinking anything until sunset. On the amazingly clean train with the carpeted cushions, I viewed the digital commercials and professional postings, but was unable to decipher exactly what the hell was going on. I stood challenging myself to try and figure out what product was actually being promoted through the Japanese ads. Kieza broke my focus. Is she looking for you, or is it only you looking for her? Kieza asked as she sat and I stood over her on the train. Her questions were spoken slowly and softly, as though she was formulating the words at the same time these thoughts occurred in her mind. I knew for sure that she was piecing things together with each speck of information I told her or she observed. I liked that better than telling her my whole story up front. Is she an older lady or is she a teenager like us? She continued. What does she look like? I mean, is there anything special about her or something that stands out, like a scar or a mole or something? Do you have a photo of her? It doesn't matter if she is looking for me, because I'm looking for her, I answered automatically. When she sees me, all her feelings will be revealed. I believed this and was waiting anxiously for Akemi's live expressions. She's 16, same as you. She's five feet five inches in her hundred thousand yen heels and five foot four when she takes them off. Her skin is flawless. She has no scars. She has a beauty mark on the inside of her right thigh, I recalled and smiled. Her soul is mysterious. Her spirit is sweet. Her smile is like sunrise, I said aloud. But as I spoke, I was also thinking to myself, reminding myself of Akemi. Kieza sat silently for the remaining ride. In my silence, I wondered, Is Akemi looking for me? Of course she is. That's why she called each day for seven days, my apartment, the dojo, my sensei. Does she know that I'm here in Tokyo? Would she believe that I would come to her home country? Did Iwa Akita let her know? Akemi! I need you to leave me some clues, little traces of yourself, I thought. And I will leave you some clues too. Leave some clues also, something to shake your heart and let you know your man is here. Rapongi is like Washington, D.C., Kiesa said as we stepped from the underground. There are a lot of embassies here, like the Chinese embassy, the American embassy, and the Dutch embassy. And as you can see when you look around, here is where you'll see a lot of people from different countries. Foreigners like Rapungi because of the nightclubs, hostess bars, and the girls. How would you know that? I asked her seriously. I had a friend who came here and got rich working at a hostess club. 
She needed a certain amount of money, so she said she was going to work as a hostess for two months. But then she liked the money so much, she never came back to school. She even missed her exams and her graduation. Sounds like it paid much more than delivering pizzas, I said without thinking. Chiesa stopped walking. You and I are scheduled to fight tonight. I'll get you back for that comment. You know that wasn't right. She corrected me. Softly, yet sternly, with no joke in it. You're right. My bad, I take it back. I was completely wrong, I said sincerely. Hostess bar work does pay more, but a girl has to dress in a nightgown or like a long, flowing, phony dress, and she has to drink liquor all night long, even after she is already drunk. And she has to flirt with the customer so that he will stay in the club and keep ordering more drinks. If I would have worked with my friend, I would have earned my whole tuition for flight school in less than a month. But I don't drink liquor, I don't smoke, and I can't flirt with a guy that I don't really like. I'd rather fight him, she said, caught up in her mounting emotion. Like how you want to fight me, I asked. She smiled, embarrassed for the first time. She paused and answered softly, I don't want to fight you because I don't like you. That's not my reason. I didn't follow up and ask her why she did want to fight me. Besides, if I were a hostess, my father would kill him. Kill who? The customer. Any one of them or maybe even all of them. He would find them, kill them, kill the owner of the club, blow the club up, and if I did something like that, he would probably kill me too. She said it matter-of-factly. He made me promise to tell him before I gave my virginity away. My father said the right man has to be strong enough to stand in front of him and explain why he wants permission to be with his daughter. If the one I choose can't face my father, then I'll have to walk away from him completely. She gestured with her right hand, waving it across her neck to show me that a coward has no chance of winning her. Chiesa was becoming more than a feminine outline in my eyes' view. She was like a drawing that was just beginning to be filled in with shades and colors. I respected her this minute more than five minutes ago. No smoking, no drinking, no fake flirting, 16 and still a virgin. In her father's absence, she was maintaining his rules and conditions for her living. In my father's absence, I was trying to do the same. We walked and climbed the several steps to Rapongi Hills under the beam of the sun until we reached the top. Need water? I asked Chiesa. Her breasts were rising and falling faster than regular breathing. I don't if you don't, she said. Once we get to the top of that winding staircase over there, we'll arrive at your address. But I think you should decide now if you want me to walk through and film the location like in Ginza or whether you want to actually go over there and inside. Or maybe you want us to go in together. I can speak in Japanese for you if you have something to say or ask. I didn't answer right away. I was thinking. The girl who you were looking for, she must speak English, right? Otherwise, how would you even know her? She questioned. I'll wait here. You walk through the whole block. Make sure you capture everything, the address, the place to the left of it, and to the right, and in front, and behind. Even any cars parked over there. Get it all on film, I directed her. Easy, she said as we approached the stairs. I got this now. I made a Durhurt prayer on the winding staircase of wide, clean cement. There was a peace and stillness in Rapongi Hills, which seemed to be the residential extension of Rapongi. Here, everything was blossoming or had already blossomed. The mansions were sturdy and well-built. People here seemed to spend more money on expensive designer doors, security walls, and iron fences than on the land itself. Each property was high quality, but condensed. I couldn't see from the outside looking in any pools or huge courtyards, backyards, or play areas. They were showcasing amazing nature more than anything else. Orchids and pansies and roses and exotic plants and flowers down to designer bushes and rock gardens. All of the trees were magnificent expressions of Allah. I could see that luxury vehicles were routine here 
and every one of them glistened as though they were washed, polished, and buffed as many times a day as I made my prayers. Strolling, I came up on a merchant alley modeled with miniature stores and short doorways. Quietly, people walked in and out, purchasing an array of items. I imagined that these people were house servants, maids, and cooks, or drivers sent here and there to make purchases for their wealthy employers. In the Sudan, when I was young, our servants were sent to market daily. Uma made sure they bought the best and freshest from the butcher, Halal, of course. After a few months of living in the United States, I could detect any dish prepared with old meats. The taste of the fresh kill was completely different than meats that had sat out, then been frozen, then defrosted, and frozen over again, which were the way most Americans seemed to be accustomed to handling and consuming their flesh. In a tiny market, I purchased peanut butter ground from Peanuts right in my presence as I waited. Also, a few bananas and oranges. I had not seen any halal restaurants yet, and these were items I could trust, just in case I had nothing for breaking the fast at sunset. I already knew that I would not allow Chiesa to prepare my meal. She hadn't offered to, but I could see that there was a possibility that she might. I didn't want to eat from her hand. Uma would say, Food from a woman's hand to a man's mouth makes the two of them familiar. I wanted my wife to serve me. Until that was possible, and while out here in Japan, I would be fed by strangers at select restaurants or I would shop at food markets and feed myself. Easing around the corner, I caught sight of a lone building on a short hill that towered over all the other residences. I took the short walk up. When I arrived in front, I entered the building behind a young boy with a bike. His hand was shaking as he tried to hold on to his bicycle while opening the locked door. His bike fell, but he got the lock opened. He held the open door with his foot and leaned over to lift his bike. He then tried to balance himself and push his bike through as he walked. He looked up at me when he felt the weight of the door he was holding disappear. He bowed his head slightly to thank me and pushed his bike in smoothly down a short corridor and further down a short ramp. The elevator arrived. I got in. On the top floor, I walked off, found a stairwell, and climbed a few steps up to the roof. A workman was on his break up there, hiding out and smoking a cigarette. I acknowledged him with a nod and acted calm and cool like I lived there. I looked out over Rapongi Hills first with my eyes and then through my binoculars. I pulled out my map and my compass and tried to pinpoint the location of the Nakamura address. As Chiesa had mentioned, it was difficult to decipher. I could easily locate the name of the street, but the numbers of the houses and buildings did not go in order the way they would have in New York. Instead, the numbers were random, based on when the structure was built, which I thought was crazy. Or, maybe it wasn't crazy. Maybe it was just a Japanese method of disguising things or making them so complicated that only they could understand. It definitely helped them to lock outsiders out. I couldn't be mad at that. My lens was focused now on the right street. Which house, I had no idea. I was glad that it was a house and not a building or a complex. I took my time and looked at each property one by one. The chain smoker smoked his cigarette slowly. I counted. He was inhaling his twelfth one. His face had the stain of sleeplessness and worry. He didn't say anything. He didn't say nothing. Neither did I. When he left, I left. I ducked into the smallest hardware store I had ever seen. It was shaped like the letter U that bent once and led you down to the cashier and out the exit. 
Son, bags, domo, I said to the only visible staffer. Three bags, please. I wrapped up my purchases securely so inquisitive Chiesa could not see through and discover more pieces of the puzzle. She was already doing enough piecing together without my permission. At a payphone tucked beneath the canopy of a florist shop, I phoned Iwa Akita to check in. Unlike yesterday, my heart was no longer filled with anticipation that she would pick up or even convey my message to Akemi. Still, I tried. My wife must have trusted her for some sensible reason. Yet after pressing the digits, I ended up with absolutely nothing. As I held the receiver, I had a stupid thought. What was the reason to open a florist shop in the middle of a small village packed with flowers, plants, and trees growing naturally? Any problems? I asked Chiesa when she returned to the winding stairs. None, she said confidently. There were some people passing by. I asked a couple of them if they wanted to be in my movie. It's interesting how the camera makes strangers become so friendly and talkative, and it's almost like they'll do anything that the person holding the camera suggests. I gotta check into a different hostel, I said, pulling out my list. Chiesa stepped in and looked at the list. Here, this one is in Harajuku. It's very close to my house, she said with a bit of excitement. Okay, let's go take a look, I told her. I hope they have locks on everything so you'll be glad to stay there. She smiled as we walked more swiftly. I had already told this girl Chiesa that I was only here for a week. How could she get so excited at me staying so close to her house for one night? She didn't know that if nothing here in Tokyo worked out and if I couldn't find Akemi here, I would leave for Kyoto tomorrow. I checked my watch. It was going on 3 p.m. Chapter 4 It was as though I were in another country, and it happened suddenly. Instead of calm and orderly passengers, the train was now packed with pumped-up youths. There were more teens in seats, and they sat and stood stuffed in at every angle, but somehow without touching. There were hands on every strap. Fingernails from natural to nine inches long and decorated with diamond dust, sculptured replicas of flower pots and other objects that were strange to see on nails of every type with color galore. When the train doors finally eased open and the feminine voice whispered, Hachiku. The young came pouring and popping out, spilling and squeezing onto the platform and pushing without touching down a slim tunnel. In Harajuku, the alleyways were narrow and packed with thousands of teens. The air smelled like sugar, vanilla, and cream. Every few feet, an outdoor vendor was wrapping ice cream into soft hut crepes and decorating them with fruit and confectioner's sugar. The narrow passageways were framed by small stores and signature shops, places to get nameplates and earrings, fake necklaces and rings, t-shirts and ribbons, lace gloves and panties, sneakers and jean belts and pocketbooks, lotions and perfumes, socks and stockings, hats and umbrellas, boots, shoes and bicycles, as well as barbers and beauticians and piercings and tattoos and tans and anything else a teenager could want. The theme was, quote, too much, unquote. A pretty girl with long black hair wore over a hundred barrettes, separated by one centimeter each. Instead of one headband, girls rocked two, three, four. Eyes were painted with patterns in purples and pinks, earmuffs in the spring, long boots with mini skirts, and real girls with fake furry cattails. There were no cops or controllers, no parents or babysitters, and no babies. Just teens. And a few adults who owned the businesses that served the teens. The crowd moved in waves, shoulder to shoulder. Three across, hundreds headed north and shoulder to shoulder. Three across, hundreds headed south, all down the same narrow alleyway. But the bugged out thing was, not none of that. 
It was the weird way the kids in the crowd were dressed. What's going on here? I asked Chiesa. Everything. Anything. There were teenage girls dressed up like baby dolls with wigs and face makeup that I was sure was making them look less attractive than they knew. They wore mini skirts with layered lace beneath making the skirts shoot out. There were corsets and ribbons, no stockings with bare thighs and bare legs and some slight suggestion of vampires, birds, mice, and cats. Heroes, aliens, heroines. Is it Japanese Halloween? I asked. Nope. This is Harajuku. This is every day. Some of the kids dress up as their favorite characters from children's stories like Strawberry Shortcake, Alice in Wonderland, Little Bo Peep, and some from manga books and some anime films like Hantoro and Naruto. Some are just doing their own thing, like them. Kiesa pointed. There were three Japanese girls in black fishnet stockings and panties wearing no skirt, no dress, and no pants. Around one of each of their thighs was a garter belt made of satin and lace. On the back of their panties were big red bows as though they were gifts given to the public. They had to be about 13, 14, or 15 years young. I won't stay here, I told Chiesa. You can. The place where you'll be staying is in the nice section. It's called Omotesando. We just need to keep walking. Hundreds of dark-eyed girls in high school uniforms swarmed around us. Their skirts were hiked up to their hips and blouse buttons open. I ran my hand over my Caesar cut. Omorisando was all upscale boutiques and shops with the same crowd. I peeped three Syrian men grilling beef and chicken kebabs, serving 59 nearly naked schoolgirls who lined up and waited patiently with pockets filled with money. Their dusty beige Syrian faces were covered in a sheen of sweat from the hot meat and heated grill. I knew they were fasting, I could tell. Many Muslims worship and restrain themselves quietly while watching others run amok. I didn't even cast an eye on these strange Japanese teenage dudes. The hostel was on Cass Street in an old mansion with Spanish architecture. Let me look around first, I told Chiesa as soon as we entered. She remained at the front desk while I explored. Hamarigani, a guy passing by in the hallway called out to me. I stopped and turned, recognizing his Swahili greeting. My father said every black person should learn Swahili. It's our common language, he told me. Peace, I told him. Haki, from Kenya. He extended his hand to me. Midnight, from New York, I countered. He just arrived, right? He asked knowingly. Yeah. How long will you stay? One night, I responded, speculating that I'd bolt out on the bullet train at sunrise. Haki laughed a bit and said, There are guys here who come for one night and stayed for two years. Then he smiled and said, Brother, if you need anything, let me be your friend. I gave him a pound. One minute. How are the rooms? Do the room doors have locks on them? I asked, since that was much more important to me than the scenery. What kind of place doesn't have locks on the door? Haki laughed some. I heard the Japanese don't steal, I said, smiling at the stupidity of my comment. But Haki said, They don't, but everyone else does. So of course there are locks. You got it, I told him. Wait, my room is two doors down. Take a look inside for yourself. Haki unlocked his door with a metal slide key. He slid his door open. He looked completely settled there in the room, his books stacked in piles like pancakes, his shirt flung over his chair, and worn shoes forming a line across the wall. A bed, a desk, a lamp, and a closet. The basics, he said. But there's no real crime in Japan, and it's clean and comfortable. I. Good looking now, I told him, stepping out to leave. For 1,500 yen extra per night, 
you could get a room with a bigger window and a terrace. Me, I'm on a budget. Most of us college students are. Was the last thing he said as I left. I saw three more guys walking in the same hallway and began to wonder if this was an all-male hostel. Over here, Chiesa called as she shot out of a side opening that led to a stairwell. We're on the second floor, room 202. I didn't check in yet, I told her as she climbed the stairs ahead of me. I kept my gaze on the marble steps. I did. I have a passport and I paid the 6,000 yen. Besides, you don't like to give anyone your name and information anyway, she said in a serious tone. No laughter. I did the conversion swiftly. 6,000 yen. That's high for a hostel. I signed you up for two nights. That's why it sounds high. You can add on the rest of the nights if you like it. I have a receipt. You can reimburse me for my expenses on this mission, right? She reached the top stair and turned and looked down at me. Why not, is all I said. Chiesa got a room bigger than Haki's. There was one big window and a fire escape that Haki had called a terrace. I leaned out the window and saw plenty of people passing by. Shoppers, skaters, athletes, musicians, and some of those costume dress-up types. I pulled back inside and had to laugh at myself. What kind of place am I in? I'm a Muslim. In the middle of a brothel with no walls that's in the middle of a nut house during Ramadan. I picked up the receiver on the desk phone, listening for dial tone. What about this phone? Does it work? It does work, but you can only receive calls if you give them a credit card at the front desk. I don't have one on me, she said. She didn't ask if I did. But you can call from room to room in here. She handed me the room key and a small folded leaflet that came with it. I pulled it all the way open. In ten different languages were the rules and benefit listings for hostel guests. I put it in the drawer. This is Naoko Nakamura's current photo, she said, pulling a paper folded in fours out of her bag. She laid it on the desk and pointed. Where did you get it? I asked her as I eased in to take a closer look. My eyes shot to the top of the page. It was dated today. Yet, Naoko Nakamura's appearance was not much older than the way he looked in an old picture in the book Sensei had gifted to me. With a head full of black hair, styled by a precise barber, he was sharply dressed executive in a $1,000 tailor business suit. He stood taller than the two men pictured at his side. He didn't wear glasses like many Asian men. Determination in his eyes, he didn't seem like the obvious villain. But we're not looking for him, right? Chiesa said, interrupting my thoughts. This is a love story, right? So where does he fit in? She stood up straight now. I thought to myself, Chiesa, quit like lightning. He doesn't, I said solemnly. Who are these guys standing beside him? And what's going on in the news story? She leaned over and read the Japanese captions. Oh, this man's the vice president of Nakamura's Pan-Asian Corporation. His name is Bishamon Akita. Kieza pulled her face up and her jaw dropped open. But I was a second ahead of her. I was Akita. We both said out loud, I locked in my game face. The girl you were looking for is Iwa Akita, and this is her father, Kieza pronounced. Purposely, I did not correct her. It would be better for her if she did not know. As my anger was stirring up slowly, it had nothing to do with Kieza. I would not allow her to get caught in a deadly mess. And what if she got questioned in a situation where this became a police matter? Yes, it would be better. The less she knew, the less she could tell. But I could tell, she wouldn't tell. Or maybe you are after Bishaman's wife as she is named Iwa Akita. I never interfere with another man's wife, I told her. And her light laugh and suspicion evaporated. 
Seeing that the only television here in the Harajuku Hostel is in an open area lounge, I asked Chiesa, If your grandfather agrees, could we go by your house and view the footage? Does he have a VCR? It's mine. I have to ask if I can have you over or not. But my grandfather knows that I'm a businesswoman. He wouldn't restrict a great client. She said with a brand of calm excitement and eagerness. Let's move then. I gotta pick up my luggage from over there anyway. On the walk over to Yoyogi, which was next door to Harachika, my curiosity intensified. I got Chiesa to translate the newspaper article and sum it up for me in English. It's announcing Nakamura's trip to Singapore this weekend, which is his first stop on his Asian corporate tour. I stopped. Would he take my wife across the continent with him, or would he leave her at home? Where is her home? Is it Tokyo? Is it Kyoto? Were Iowa and Akemi being heavily supervised right now, and simply waiting for their fathers to leave on a trip so they can contact me? Then Akemi would just pick up the phone when I called Iowa and say, Take me back to New York. I want to go home with you. I want to see you in my home. What ifs were choking me. The thought battle was f***ing up my head. The other voice in my head said only two words. Take action. So, I gotta chill, just for now, as I get ready to put together another episode for this Sister Soldier miniseries on Ralph Reed's. I would like, or rather love, to thank you fellow queens and kings for tuning in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. If you would like to leave a small donation or connect with me via social media, please do so via www.solo.to forward slash RGMC 2407. And don't forget to tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you, fellow royalty, on the next edition of this Sister Soldier miniseries on Ralph Reed's. When things make you angry, take a deep breath. Stop wasting the little bit of life you have left. On that energy burning negativity, bring forth positivity. It's for you and me, true indeed. You will see. You are now experiencing the Ren Pet Phenomenon, an Afrofuturistic book series. Afrofuturism is the cure to sci fi. Download now and experience melanin biotechnology. Want to sound like a professional? The Merge Studio should be your next stop. A private, intimate environment by invite only. Our engineer has years of experience mastering mix downs, production, and beats. Available all in our one stop shop of entertainment. Merge Studios, let us help you sound the best, be the best, and beat the rest. Let's come together at Merge Studios. Mike Mountain, and I want to give a special shout out to Ralph Anthony Garcia of the United Ronin Networks at YouTube. Make sure y'all go to the United Ronin Networks at YouTube. Check out his channel. Check out his series, Ralph Reads. Give it a like. Subscribe to his channel. And, um, 
Um, check out when you got the offer. Some really good stuff up there. This is Mike Mountain, and this message is approved by me. Peace.